Welcome to Harvest Hills Alliance Church. Welcome to those that are joining us online, both on Facebook Live and YouTube. It is great to be able to gather. It is great to be able to worship God together. We are excited for the opportunity we have to lift on high the name of Jesus. Today we'll be reminded that Jesus Christ is our Lord and Savior, and we have an opportunity to praise and to glorify his name, and that is good, and that is the right thing for us to do. Today, let us passionately, with our whole selves, lift on high the name of Jesus and worship him who is so worthy of our praise. I'd like to highlight a few things within our faith, faith community. And the first one is, next Sunday, we're going to see a lot of changes. And if we think back over this past pandemic, these 18 months, when we hear the word changes, that usually means a bad thing. But rest assured, changes next week is a good thing. And I'm excited for them, and I hope that you are as well. It's all going to be a great uh, change for us. We're going to be going back to two services. So starting next Sunday, we'll have a 9.15 and an 11 o'clock service. And at our 9.15, that will be the service that we stream going forward. So for those that are joining us online, instead of joining us at 10 o'clock, we'll be online at 9.15, and you can catch our live stream at that time or when you're able to tune in later on. During our 9.15 service, we will have youth starting at 9 o'clock, so they're going to be coming a little bit earlier, and then at 9.15, we'll have nursery through grade 4 and programming for them. And then at our 11 o'clock service, we'll have programming for nursery through grade 6. 
So it will be a great morning. We're excited for that. Many opportunities. And there are many ministries that are going to be starting in the next couple weeks. So we'd encourage you to check out our bulletin at hhachurch.com for any information on specific ministries. And we'd encourage you to check that out. Lots of great information there. Now, also next Sunday, following our 11 o'clock service, we'd encourage those that are at our 11 to stay and those that come to our 915 to come back. We're going to be having a Harvest Hawaiian Hoopla. We haven't been able to travel over these last few months, so we're bringing Hawaii to North Central Calgary. Does that sound like a good idea? We're excited for this. We're going to have pulled pork sandwiches, games, activities, and yes, a dunk tank. So we're hoping it's going to be hot because I heard the water is going to be cold and I might end up in it. So we're excited for that. It's going to be a great day. All you need to bring is a lawn chair. We'll supply the rest, and it'll be a great opportunity to connect with each other once again next Sunday after our 11 o'clock service, Harvest Hawaiian Hoopla. Please come back and stay if you're at the 11, and it's going to be a great time to connect and just have a good time together. One of the challenges this past year is be able to plan and organize different events, not knowing what restrictions are going to be at that given time. And as a result, we weren't able to do our Stampede Breakfast. And that's an amazing serve for our community. And we have so many people that we're able to have interaction with and contact, serve our community. We hear from so many people on how they love that event. So we are going to be doing a Harvest Community Carnival on Saturday the 17th. And this is going to be 18th, sorry. And this is going to be a great opportunity to bless the community, to get to know those that are in the north central Calgary. And there's going to be a great opportunity for us to represent Jesus. It's going to be a barbecue. There'll be carnival treats, bouncy houses, a petting zoo. So it's kind of a combination of our stampede breakfast with a barbecue in the fall. So we're looking forward to that. We do need some help with that. And we'd encourage you to check out the table in the foyer. You can sign up to be a part of volunteering for that. The event itself will run from 11 a.m. until 2 p.m. And this will just be a way to bless the community. We're looking for people to help out on the Saturday as well. And we do need some individuals on the Friday to help us prepare. So if you're busy Saturday and able to come Friday, again, Pastor Diane will be in the foyer following the service. And you can register to be a volunteer for that event. And that will be a great way to serve our community. 11 till 2 next Saturday. This Saturday. And then... Speaking of Pastor Diane, she is looking also for, some ma- for many volunteers to help out with kids' ministry. As we con- continue forward in the fall, we know that youth and children are a blessing. We believe that they're a gift from God, made in the image of Jesus, and we want to provide programming that will help them grow in their relationship with Jesus Christ, as well as grow in the individuals that God has created them to be. So we need some help in that way. Diane will be in the foyer, as I said, looking, at the, looking after some carnival signups, and she'd love to talk to you about children's ministry as well. So if you'd like to be involved, please talk to Pastor Diane. We're looking for people from nursery through grade four, and there's a great opportunity for anybody to get involved. Please talk to Pastor Diane, and she can give you some more information about what's entailed and how you can be part of such an incredible ministry. Now these words from Ephesians chapter two as we prepare our hearts, it says this. God saved you by his grace when you believed. And you can't take credit for this. It is a gift from God. Salvation is not a reward for the good things we have done, so none of us can boast about it. For we are God's masterpiece. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus so we can do the good things he planned for us long ago. Let us praise the name of Jesus, the God who created us as his masterpiece together today. Good morning, everybody. It's great to see you all here. I'd like to invite you to stand and join with us in worship as we sing praises to our God. Let's declare this together. I count on one thing. The same God that never fails will not fail me. The same God who's never late is working all things out. You're working all things out. So yes, I will lift you high in the lowest valley. Yes, I will bless your name. Yes, I will sing for joy when my heart is heavy. 
Running after, running after. 
Romans 6 says, For we know that our old self was crucified with him, so that the body ruled by sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin, because anyone who has died has been set free from sin. Now if we died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. For we know that since Christ was raised from the dead, he cannot die again. Death no longer has mastery over him. The death he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. In the same way, count yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. 
Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its evil desires. Do not offer any part of yourself to sin as an instrument of wickedness, but rather offer yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to light and offer every part of yourself to him as an instrument of righteousness. For sin shall no longer be your master because you are not under the law, but under grace. Salvation in your name, 
Yeah, so I know you haven't been up here for a little while. I haven't been up here for a little while. You might be just as nervous as I am to be standing up here. And I don't see a whole lot of, like, younger kids, but come on up. Come on up, honey. Come on up. I'll move the cords. Here. Come on. Come on. Come on up. Yep. You don't have to be scared of me. I like kids. Come on, you guys. Have a seat. Have a seat at the front. Just have a seat at the front. Hi, honey, how are you? I don't know your name, but I'm sure we'll get to know each You can come sit right here, sweetie. You can come sit right up here, okay? I'm just moving the cord so you don't trip. Yep. Have a trip. Yep. Come on. Yeah, have a seat. Have a seat. Come on up. Have a seat. You can scooch down a little bit. Scooch. You can sit right on the front row, right there, right on the bottom, honey, okay? Thank you, Pastor Diane. Wow, it has been quite a few months since I've seen some of you. Some of you I've never met before, and that's because you haven't been in Harvest Kids before. That's okay, we'll get to know you. You guys are looking fantastic, just got to say. So one of my favorite stories, and if you've been in Harvest Kids for a while, or if you've been in Harvest Kids before... You probably know this story, and maybe you've even heard me tell it before. So the story, one one of my favorite stories, and the story I like to tell is because there are so many things jam-packed into this story. We don't have time to talk about all of them today, but my favorite story is the story of David and Goliath. Some of you are going, oh yeah, Mr. Vern, I've heard this story a hundred times. You can't tell me anything about it. Might be true, but we know some things. We know that Goliath was huge, right? Almost 10 feet tall, huge. He had big arms, he had big hands, he was a champion, that's what the Bible tells us. He was experienced in battle. He knew how to do battle. He knew how to fight. He was huge. And he and his team, let's call him his team, they were having a little battle with a guy named David and David's team. We don't know a lot about David at this point in his life. We know that he was the youngest of a whole bunch of brothers. Um, We know that he was a shepherd. We know that David didn't have a whole lot of equipment when he was out looking after the sheep. If you know the story, maybe you've read it in a book, maybe you've seen it in a little movie, you know how the story ends. Goliath had all kinds of protection. He had a shield, he had a sword, he had a big helmet. Uh, he had a guy that would help carry his, his shield. He had a big, um, what did I say, a sh- uh, sword. He had a big spear. He had all kinds of protection. Things on his shins to protect his legs. David, what do we know about David? What did David have? Can somebody tell me what did David have? David had a sling. That's all he had. And five stones, right? That's all David had. What do we know? You guys know how this battle ends. We know what happened to Goliath. David beat Goliath. Why did David beat Goliath? Because God was on David's side, right? God was in control. That's what we know about the story. Let's talk about some stuff that's going on today. All kinds of crazy things happening in the news, right? All things, you know, guys, I'm sure you've all heard the word COVID and what COVID means, and you've heard your moms and dads and other adults talking about COVID. COVID is crazy. Us adults, lots of times, we don't know what's going on. I heard Pastor Aaron and Pastor uh, Myron talking this morning about COVID. We don't even know what the rules are for church anymore. Should we wear a mask? Do we have to to wear a mask? We don't know. It It seems like it changes every day, and I know it's affected lots of things for you guys in school. Sometimes you're in class, 
Sometimes you're at home, sometimes you're learning on the computer, sometimes mom and dad were trying to help you at home while they were doing their own jobs because they were working from home. All kinds of crazy things, and it seemed like moms and dads and adults, we were always listening to the news. What are the rules going to be today? Because we never knew. You know what? We haven't seen the end of this COVID story yet, have we? We still don't know what's going to happen. But one thing we do know, God knows about COVID, and God is in control. Right? 2020. When you think about 2020, has anybody been to the eye doctor yet before you went to school this year? Maybe you went to the eye doctor? Two times. And when you went to the doctor, and the eye doctor looked at your eyes, and I see you don't wear glasses like me, and if you have really, really, really good eyes, what does the doctor say? You have 2020 vision, right? 2020 vision. That's what the eye doctor says, okay? When we think about the year 2020, and 2020 means perfect, great vision. When we think about the year 2020, we think, and the beginning of the year, we think, if we look back, mostly as adults, things were going great. The economy was great, we had jobs, everything was going great. And then March hit, the middle of March, and it seemed like everything fell apart, right? I know I went home, I was working from home, in about June of that year, um, so before I go there, do you know in your body you've got all kinds of little blood vessels and sometimes if you look at your arm you can see little blood vessels and little red or blue lines they look like in your arms or in your legs? Those are called blood vessels or veins. And sometimes, if we have little things going wrong in our bodies, sometimes we'll get a little block in our, in our blood vessels. And if those little blocks, if they go into our heart, you might hear about somebody that had a heart attack. If they go into our brains, you might hear that somebody had a stroke. Well, last June, so June of 2020, the year that was supposed to be perfect, so we thought, I had a stroke. So I had, the doctor said I actually had a whole bunch of little blocks in my brain. And it happened really quick and I hardly felt anything, but the doctor still had to do some tests. So I spent some time in the hospital, and the doctors did a whole bunch of tests and took pictures of my body that are really clear, be cool, because they can see everything in my body, or your body if you ever have a test, uh, pictures like that. And while the doctors were doing those tests, they said, Mr. Vern, we think you have some cancer in your body. Well, that was, pretty scary news for me and my family, and we didn't know what to do. Um, so since June of last year, every three weeks, I've been going to the hospital. And every three weeks, the doctors give me some special medicine, and it makes me a little bit sick for a few days, and then I start to feel better, and then I go back to the hospital, and I get some more special medicine, and they put it right into my, right into my blood vessels, into my veins. So, I don't know what's going to happen. I don't know what the future holds for me. But I know one thing. I know God is in control. That's what I know. So, Mr. Vern, what does that story mean for us? All of us kids sitting up here today and for the adults today. What does that mean for us? If you've been in Harvest Kids before, you may have heard me say this before. The most important decision you can ever make and some of you know already what I'm going to say. The most important decision you can ever make is to ask Jesus into your life. Jesus wants to be in control of your life. Jesus wants to have a special relationship with you, a special friendship with you. And that, as you've heard me say before, right? Jesus wants to have a very special relationship with you, and that's the most important decision you can ever make in your life. If you want somebody to help you, to pray with you, you can talk to Pastor Diane. You can talk to a Sunday school teacher. You can talk to Pastor Myron or Pastor Aaron. You can talk to maybe mom and dad, anybody, okay? Start with mom and dad, and they can help. They can pray with you and help you ask Jesus into your heart, okay? Thank you. Great listening. Hope to see you again in Sunday school. You can go back to moms and dads.
Thank you, Mr. Vern, for sharing that story and sharing some of your story as well. We know it's been a challenge for you. We've been praying for you as we have been praying for many others in our faith community over this past year for known issues as well as for unknown issues. So we know that our God is a God who hears our prayers and we are grateful to be able to partner in the ministry of prayer in any way that we can. And we, as, just so everybody is aware, we would count that a privilege to come alongside anybody during whatever may be going on in your life. If you re would require prayer, please reach out to the church. At this time in our service, we're going to take a moment to receive our tithes and offerings. There's a number of ways that this can happen. For those in the room, there's offering plates available at the back on your way out. You can drop off your gift then. For those online and for those in the room as well, you can give through our website at hhachurch.com give or through e-transfer using the email address giving at hhachurch.com and use the message window with your contact information as well as your designation of your gift. Gifts can also be dropped off or brought into the church office throughout the week. Let us pray. Father God, we thank you that you are in control. We thank you for that reminder today. We thank you that you know what's going on and that you're not surprised by today and you won't be surprised by tomorrow and that you hold the world in your hands. Father, we thank you that you love each and every one of us and that you poured out your love for us by paying the price for our sins on the cross and that we have an opportunity to experience the fullness of life, the fullness of relationship with our God, our Father in heaven. Father, I pray that today that we will sense your presence in a very special way and that you will continue to reveal yourself in a way that will transform our hearts and our lives. Father, we know that this season's been hard and that many people have maybe grown further away from you than they would have hoped or maybe people don't know you and they're trying to understand what it means to have a relationship with God. Father, we pray that you will pour your spirit upon them in a very special way and that they will sense your presence and your peace and that they will see a God that loves them, a God that is pursuing them. Father, today, as we worship your name, I pray that you'll be pleased with the offering of, of, of praise that we give to you today, Father, and we pray that you will continue to have your way amongst us here. Fill this place with your spirit. Fill our homes with your spirit. Wherever we're joining today, Father, we pray that the spirit of God will be evident in a very special and life-changing way. Father, we thank you for our international workers that are serving around the world that are like us dealing with difficulty and uncertainty and just varying of restrictions. Father, we pray that as many of our international workers are heading back into the field for those that have been in Canada, we pray that you will protect them, that you'll watch over them, that you'll give them many opportunities to be your hands, feet, and voice in the countries that you've called them to serve. Father, we pray that you will open doors, that you'll give chances for them to share the hope and love of Jesus, that you will give them favor in the communities that they serve, and that they'll be able to represent the gospel of Jesus. We thank you that they are on mission with you and for you and a partner with Harvest Hills Alliance Church. And Father, for us here in Calgary, I pray that you will help us to see our communities, our neighbors, everybody that we come in contact with as people created in the image of God and so worthy of your love, and that we will reach out sharing the impact that you've had on our life, and that we will represent you well. Father, these gifts that we're about to receive, we pray that you will use them for kingdom purposes, to impact the kingdom of God and to make your name famous in our city, our country, and the world. We thank you that you are at work. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Good morning, friends who've joined us online in north central calgary or perhaps airdrie points beyond great to connect with you welcome to you who are in our auditorium in person again a warm welcome to each one of you today we're wrapping up our summer road trip teaching series and god willing next sunday we'll launch into our new teaching series that's called ekg living out the heart of the gospel ekg of course stands for exponential kingdom growth and that's our strategy going forward for a ministry of spiritual multiplication in North Central Calgary and points beyond. And everybody that's a part of the Harvest family gets to be on side with that exciting adventure of making Jesus' love and hope real in the lives of the people that we're neighbors to all over this part of our city. So today we wrap up. And I want to invite you to take your Bibles and turn to Luke chapter 18, verses 35 to 43 on your device. Luke 18, 35 to 43. And this is the final message in our summer road trip series. And I hope that this summer you've enjoyed, had some fun with, and been challenged by the different journeys from the Word of God that we have studied together. Now, when you think of famous people who are visually impaired... Who comes to mind? 
Maybe you think of Helen Keller. Someone said Stevie Wonder. Maybe Andrea Bocelli. Or perhaps the great gospel hymn writer, Fanny Crosby. How about this person? Has anyone heard of Charlie Boswell? Not so many. Charlie lost his sight while serving his country overseas in the Second World War. He was rescuing a friend from a tank that was on fire. Well, sometime after that, Charlie returned home. And after a period of recovery, he determined that he would not let his blindness, his debility, hold him back. And so Charlie took up, of all things, golfing. And he became a very good golfer very quickly. Charlie, who passed away in 1995, regularly shot in the low 80s. If you do any golfing at all, you know that that's a primo score. He, on three occasions, shot a hole in one. 16 different times, Charlie won the National Blind Golfing Championship. And then one day in 1958, Charlie was awarded for his golf prowess and for his perseverance the prestigious Ben Hogan Award. Part of winning that award meant that he was going to get to meet his hero, the great golfer Ben Hogan. And Ben Hogan was in that era kind of like Rory McIlroy would be in our day. He was the golfer. So there was Charlie, he received his award, he got a chance to meet Ben Hogan, and he was starstruck by his own admission. But he got his wits together enough to tell Mr. Hogan that one of his bucket list items was that at some time in his life he'd have a chance to shoot a round of golf with Mr. Hogan. Well, Ben Hogan quickly agreed to this. Then Charlie said, would you like to play for money? Ben Hogan said, I don't think we should do that. Charlie chirped him a little bit and said, come on, Mr. Hogan, are you afraid of losing to a blind guy? Mr. Hogan said, okay, I'll play you for money. How much? Charlie said, how about $1,000 a hole? Ben Hogan was totally rattled as the story goes, and he said, Charlie, that's a lot of money. How many strokes do you want me to give you? And Charlie said, I do not want any strokes. I'll play you straight up. And Ben Hogan said, Charlie, I cannot do that. What would that look like to everybody else? That I took advantage of a blind man. And Charlie Boswell said to Ben Hogan, no need to worry, Mr. Hogan. Our tea time is set for 10 o'clock tonight. <laughs> Don't you love it? That's good. This morning, we're going to study an encounter that the Lord Jesus had with a man as he journeyed on the road through Jericho and ultimately to Jerusalem. So you've got your device or your Bible in hand. Follow along as I read Luke 18, beginning with verse 35. As Jesus approached Jericho, a blind man was sitting by the roadside begging when he heard the crowd going by, he asked what was happening. They told him, Jesus of Nazareth is passing by. He called out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Those who led the way rebuked him and told him to be quiet. But he shouted all the more, son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus stopped and ordered the man to be brought to him. When he came near... Jesus asked him, what do you want me to do for you? Lord, I want to see, he replied. Jesus said to him, receive your sight. Your faith has healed you immediately. He received his sight and followed Jesus, praising God. When all the people saw it, they also prayed God, praised God. Just before we dive into this passage of Scripture, three general observations. First of all, as this passage of Scripture unfolds, our Lord Jesus is about a week away from that day and that moment in which he will willingly, in love, give himself on the cross of Calvary to death for the sins of the world. So at this point in Jesus' earthly ministry, he is headed for Jerusalem with resolve. As he journeys, an entourage of people, a caravan of people, including his closest disciples, are journeying with him. Here's a second observation. We know from Mark and Matthew's parallel account that the blind guy's name was Bartimaeus. It just means the son of Timaeus. 
Now, Bartimaeus literally appears on the pages of Scripture one time. And that is in relation to this specific moment in history. In other words, he had one chance to meet Jesus, and he did. I do not in any sense intend to be cheesy or melodramatic. But could that reality be the case for someone here today or someone who's connecting online with us that this is your one chance to meet Jesus? What's for sure is we do not know what the future holds. None of us know that. That's why the Bible would say, today if you hear his voice, do not harden your heart. Here's the third observation I make. Bartimaeus, whom we commonly know as blind Bartimaeus, is by no means the only blind guy in this passage of Scripture. The disciples of Jesus were also suffering from some serious myopia. We're going to see that in the passage of Scripture, but flip back a few verses to chapter 18 and verse 15 to get a sense of what I'm talking about. Verse 15. People were bringing babies to Jesus for him to place his hands on them. When the disciples saw this, they rebuked them, But Jesus called the children to him and said, Let the little children come to me and do not hinder them, for the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. Do you get what I'm saying? The blind man is not the only blind person in this passage of Scripture. In fact, you could argue that the blind man was actually the least blind person in the story. Now, the Word of God teaches then that every person has two sets of eyes. We have physical eyes. And the gift of sight is an amazing gift. We also have spiritual eyes. And apart from the transforming grace of God upon us in Christ Jesus, when we make a volitional faith decision to yield our lives to King Jesus as the only one who could forgive us and lead our lives, we are totally blind. We're as blind spiritually as Bartimaeus was physically. But here's the awesome good news. Our King Jesus gives sight to the blind. Amen? Now let's dive into the scripture. And first of all, see in that 35th verse, the condition of Bartimaeus. We already know, but let's read the verse. As Jesus approached Jericho, a blind man was sitting by the roadside begging. So there was a blind man. His name was Bartimaeus. He was sitting there and he was begging. Now, in our world, 3% of Canadians are blind or have some degree of visual disability. That's 750,000 people. Worldwide, 253 million people are fully blind or have some degree of visual impairment. Imagine living in a world where you couldn't see the rolling cascade of a waterfall or watch a sunset or the stars in the sky or the smile of a child. Imagine a world in which life for you is a dark hallway. That was Bartimaeus. And there are quite a few other people in our own country and around the world that are in the same situation. Again, the gift of sight is an amazing gift And for that gift that God has granted me and us today, we give him thanks. Amen? But again, the blindness of the man in the story, Bartimaeus, is a picture of the spiritual condition of people apart from the Lord Jesus Christ. And so in 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 4, the word of God would say this. The God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers so that they cannot see the light of the gospel that displays the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. Apart from the Spirit of God working through the Word of God to open our eyes so that we can respond in faith to King Jesus, the one alone who could rescue us from our sins, we are totally spiritually blind. What's more, in and of ourselves, we can't do anything about it. Absolutely Nothing. But this is where our king comes in. Our Lord Jesus, by his perfect sacrifice on the cross, by his death and resurrection, has purchased spiritual sight for every person who will receive it by faith. So if you, by the grace of God and the transformational power of the Lord Jesus Christ, have your spiritual sight as you watch online or as you sit in the room this morning, 
We give God thanks for our spiritual eyes, right? Not only that, as we move into this fall and the launch of our strategy for a ministry of spiritual multiplication, please join together Harvest Family in asking that the Spirit of God would be poured out upon the surrounding communities, that the eyes of people would be opened to see the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ, who is the one who is so able to give sight to the blind. Now, there may be someone who's connected with us this morning, and in an introspective moment, in an honest moment with yourself and before God, you'd say, I'm actually walking right now in spiritual darkness. I've never made a volitional faith choice to yield my life to the Lord Jesus Christ. Hey, today's your day then. Like the man in the story. Simply give your yes in faith to Jesus. Your sins will be forgiven. You'll be restored to relationship with God. Your eyes will be opened. And you will know that God has granted you, even as his word is true, the free gift of forever life. So that was the condition of the man in the story. He was blind, physically blind, which is a powerful picture in Scripture of spiritual blindness or not knowing the Lord Jesus Christ and being separated from God as a result. Note secondly then the cry of Bartimaeus. The cry of Bartimaeus, verse 36. When he heard the crowd going by, couldn't see it obviously, but he heard the commotion. When he heard the crowd going by, he asked, what was happening? They told him, Jesus of Nazareth is passing by. He called out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. When Bartimaeus, hearing that the rabbi from Nazareth, Jesus, was passing by, when he heard that, he immediately called out what? Jesus, son of David of David, have mercy on me. That phrase, son of David, powerfully messianic. That would have been a really unique thing in that moment for Bartimaeus to confess. Somewhere along the line, he'd come to the understanding in his heart that this teacher from Nazareth wasn't just another guy. He wasn't just a teacher. He was the one of whom the prophets foretold. He was the promised Messiah, deliverer. And the one who would come into this world to set his people free. Bartimaeus was convinced that Jesus was the promised one, the holy one, God incarnate. God with skin in his face. And so he cried out, Jesus, son of David, Messiah, have mercy on me. Maybe Bartimaeus had heard stories of how the Lord Jesus Christ had ministered to people. Setting them free spiritually pouring out miraculous works of healing upon their lives, giving sight to other blind people. Maybe Bartimaeus had heard about that day in which Jesus of Nazareth stepped into the synagogue in his hometown and read the words from the prophet Isaiah that are recorded in Luke 4, 18 and 19. And those words are these. The Spirit of the Lord is on me because he's anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And of course, on that day in the synagogue in which Jesus read those words of the prophet Isaiah, he told everybody and said, in this very moment, in me, the words of the prophet are fulfilled before you. Perhaps Bartimaeus was aware of that moment in which Jesus declared that he was the promised Messiah. Whatever the case was, he knew some things. He knew that he didn't have his sight. He knew that Jesus was the Messiah. He was coming down the road. And this king could give sight to the blind. And so he cried out, Jesus, son of David. And then what was the second part of his cry? Have mercy on me. Have mercy on me. Grace and I were talking about a road trip that we went on with our kids some years ago. And I grew up in southern Alberta in Lethbridge, so lots of times for day trips. Growing up, we would go to Waterton National Park for a day trip. So we were going to go tenting with our guys at Waterton Lakes National Park. And I was kind of excited to take them where I'd been in my growing up years. Now, if you've been there, as you're traveling 
south from Fort McLeod towards Cardston, just north of Cardston, there's a fork in the road. And you got to take the sweeping right-hand turn, and that breaks you west to go to Waterton. If you miss the turn to go straight, you're driving down Main Street, Cardston, which is a little town, 3,500 people. The Main Street, the entire thing is eight blocks long. So we're driving, and I missed the turn, and I immediately knew it. I immediately knew I'd missed the turn. So at the very next intersection, one block into the booming metropolis that's Cardston, I flipped a U-turn at the intersection. As I'm flipping the U-turn, a few blocks down Main Street, guess what I see? I see an RCMP cruiser. And a bunch of thoughts are going through my head all at the same time. I'm thinking, oh man, did he see me? And if he saw me, is he going to care? And then this was not my finest hour. I openly admit this. My next thought was, i got to get out of here quick. Because if I turn around and kind of zip it up there and then turn left and head west to Waterton Lakes, if he is coming after me, he's at least going to have to make a choice whether I went straight or turned. Again, it wasn't my finest hour, but it's exactly what I did, and it was what was going on up here. So I was kind of, sort of, I thought at that point, trying to get away in the RCMP. Apologies. I made the turn west, and in my rearview mirror, I watch the police officer now, and the lights on the car are on, and he's bombing north. And I'm thinking, great, he went the wrong way. Only about a half a minute later, he started going the right way. And he obviously made the loop and came up behind me. Here's the thing about that road going west from Cardston to Waterton. There's no shoulder. It's a skinny little road. I'm thinking to myself, like, I don't even know how I can stop. You can't stop in the middle of the road, can you? So in my brain, I mean, this was, now at this point, this was my honest thinking. I just thought, I'm just going to go to the nearest approach or a driveway or something, and I can safely turn in there. He was not impressed with that because he followed me for a while with the lights on. Now the siren came on. My guys were thinking, oh my goodness, this is awesome. <laughs> we're on holidays and police lights and sirens. I was less enthused. So about that time, I slammed on the brakes. Okay, I stopped right there in the middle of the road. Now when that police officer came out to my window, he was not in a good mood. And he gave me a look that said, okay, I know that you kind of sort of tried to get away on me. And he dressed me down. He uh, kind of worked me over verbally for a minute there. And then at the end of the conversation, he said, but getting a ticket while you're on vacation is a really lousy thing to have happened, right? Felt like a rhetorical question. I said, right. And he said, so, smarten up, use your head, and I'm going to give you a warning. Now, justice in that moment, wow. <laughs> I don't even know what that would have been. Probably fairly expensive at the least. But he gave me mercy. Are we not grateful that ours is a God of mercy? Paul says in, Philipp in Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 4 that our God is rich in mercy. His mercies are new every day. I mean, we're sitting here together or we're connecting online we woke up from a night's rest god's mercies are new this morning amen we celebrate the mercy of god and we openly confess that if it was up to any one of us to deal with our spiritual blindness and figure out our way to heaven we would never ever get there but king jesus is rich in mercy and the moment that the blind sinner entrusts hers or his life to him our blinders are removed, our sight is restored, and we belong to the king forever. You who are watching online or in the room, if you've not experienced Jesus in this way, and not a few of us have, the beauty of the grace of God is you can have that moment with Jesus this very day. Well, that's the cry of Bartimaeus. Now I want you to see the confidence of Bartimaeus. I love this. Verse 39. Those who led the way. Who do you suppose was leading the way with Jesus? Those were his closest disciples. They're at the front of the pack. Those who led the way rebuked him and told him to be quiet. But he shouted, all the more, son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus stopped 
and ordered the man to be brought to him. When he came near, Jesus asked him, what do you want me to do for you? Lord, I want to see, he replied. So picture this. There's the blind man beside the road, understanding that Jesus of Nazareth is passing by, and he's calling out, Jesus, son of David, Messiah, have mercy on me. You're the one who can restore my sight. And meanwhile, the disciples of Jesus did what? They went over to that guy and said, shut up. Can't you see Jesus is busy? Uh, This is not a scheduled stop. We're on our way to Jerusalem. Put a lid on it. Do you remember what we said earlier? That the blind man is arguably the least blind person in this passage of Scripture? What a stunning moment for those disciples. But in response to their trying to get Bartimaeus to shut out, what did he do? The Word of God says he shouted all the louder. It's a different word, shouted, than the previous word called out. The word shouted out means that he shouted. Can you imagine? That was kind of an awkward moment, I bet. But he would not relent. And then two awesome words. Verse 40 says what? Jesus stopped. At this point, I think that the disciples' heads were close to exploding. They were having a hard time figuring out what was going on here. But then Jesus, to that confusing moment for them, did this. The Word of God says he commanded that Bartimaeus be brought to him. The word command, it's a military word. It's like a commanding officer speaking to his charges. And a commanding officer's verbal directive is to be obeyed implicitly. This is not to be debated. He commanded some of those same disciples to bring Bartimaeus to him. Oh my goodness, do you think they were having a sheepish moment? I'm going to guess so. And at the same time, their heads were spinning and they were trying to figure this all out. But Jesus, he knew what he was going to do. He knew that he was going to give this man sight. But he wanted to connect the miracle to the mission. And what's the mission? From the heart of the Lord Jesus, friends, people are not the problem. People are not an impediment. People aren't something that we got to work our way around. People are the mission. Amen? Jesus came to give sight to the blind. So they bring Bartimaeus, the disciples, to the Lord Jesus for this one encounter that he would have with the living Christ. Now here's a question that I pondered this week. And I put it out there for all of us. Thinking of those disciples rebuking the guy who needed Jesus' help. Who's the person in our lives that we would rather rebuke than take to Jesus? Who is that person for me? Who's that person for us? And then the six million dollar question. Jesus looked at Bartimaeus. And he said, what do you want me to do for you? Rhetorical question, right? I mean, talk about sword having a keen way of expressing the obvious. The guy is blind. But what if in that moment, what if in that moment Bartimaeus, who maybe hadn't had a decent meal for two or three days, essentially went for a Big Mac? What if he'd said that? Jesus, I'd just like something to eat. Or what if he had said, could you just spot me a few coins? Or, oh my goodness, my tunic and my sandals, they're really worn out. I could use a new wardrobe. What if he had done that? Only Bartimaeus, filled with faith, being convinced that Jesus was the promised Messiah, the one who could give sight to the blind, the one who loved to pour his mercy on people, he went all in in that moment, in a crowd no less. And he said, Jesus, I want to be able to see. Last Sunday, Pastor Sherry, in reading a page from the book that she's reading, asked a great question. What if Jesus actually meant what he said? What if Jesus actually meant the things that he said, the things that he says to us in the word of God? And with that in mind, here's the thing. 
Our Lord Jesus, who is filled with mercy, still loves to stop when people call out to him. And if he stops, or when he stops, let me say, in my life, in my circumstance, if he were to ask us this morning, what do you want me to do for you? Do you have an answer? What would your answer be? Would it be, Lord Jesus, I need my spiritual sight? Or, Lord Jesus, I have a relationship that's marked by darkness. Would you bring incredible light to it? Lord Jesus, I'm wrestling with a personal affliction. I need your healing hand upon my life. If Jesus were to ask you today, what do you want me to do for you? Oh, friends, in faith in our King whose greatness the universe cannot contain. In answer to that question, as Bartimaeus models for us, don't set the bar low. Let's go all in, in faith, believing that our king is able. All right, one last thought, and it's verses 42 and 43, and I want you to see the commitment of Bartimaeus. In response to Bartimaeus' faith-filled confession, Lord, I want to see. Jesus said to him, receive your sight. Your faith has healed you. Kaboom! The guy's vision was restored. And the first thing or the first person the blind man saw was Jesus. How cool is that? Verse 43, immediately he received his sight and followed Jesus. So this man, in this moment, and After this scriptural account, Bartimaeus fades from the pages of scripture. It seems like this was his moment. He met King Jesus. He had his physical sight restored and his spiritual eyes were opened. And he followed the Lord Jesus, praising God. And when all the people saw what had happened, the crowd was electrified. And everybody praised the Lord God. Now that Bartimaeus had both his spiritual and his physical eyes restored, and he's a part of that entourage that's moving down the road through Jericho on the way to Jerusalem, could we imagine that just maybe along the way to people in the crowd or people standing beside the road or someone else in another village, he said, hey, everybody, that guy over there, that's Jesus the Messiah. He gave me my sight, and you'll do the same thing for you. Doctor was an international worker, a missionary serving half a world away, and he was an ophthalmologist. And so one day through an operation, he was able to restore sight to a blind man. The guy, of course, went off just ecstatic at the restoration of his vision. And the doctor didn't hear from the fellow again. Until uh, sometime later, some days later, there was a knock on his home. And when the doctor opened the door, here was this fellow that he'd done the eye surgery on. And this time, this guy had with him like a rope. And he was holding the front of the rope. And hanging onto the rope were ten other blind people. We who are followers of Jesus by faith, who have experienced the grace of God who've had our sight restored, we get to. And in fact, we must join Jesus on mission now to point others to Jesus, that they might experience the restoration of their sight in the way that we have as well. Make no mistake, when we call out to King Jesus, to the present, he stops. He hears And he stops, and he saves, and he heals. This is our king. He gives sight to the blind. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, just an incredible account that grabs our hearts and makes us think so many things. We celebrate your supernatural healing power on the life of this man. We celebrate that moment in his life where his spiritual eyes were opened and he really saw and was connected to Jesus by faith. 
Thank you, Lord Jesus, that you are still at work in wonderful, merciful, grace-filled ways to give sight to the blind. I'm thinking of that person or persons that's connected with us this morning, and perhaps they've not experienced the freedom, the liberty, the restoration of spiritual sight that you bring to all who yield their lives to you in faith. Spirit of the living God, in these moments, would you just continue in your merciful work to reveal the beauty, the glory of the Lord Jesus to such a one? And then, Jesus, I'm just thinking that question you ask. What do you want me to do for you? There's a lot of people connected to this time of worship this morning, and that group of people, Father God, reflects so many different needs. You're still asking that question. Grant us faith to believe you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. This time in our service, we're going to take an opportunity to receive communion together. For those in the room, if you didn't grab your elements on the way in, I'd encourage you to go out those doors, and there's two tables set up with elements provided on them. For those joining us online, please make sure that you have your elements ready at home, and in a few moments, we will partake together. This summer, we spent time journeying on different biblical roads. The most impactful road trip ever was the road to the cross. Our Lord and Savior lived on earth with the purpose of taking that journey, of walking to the cross to be the sacrificial lamb of all of humanity. Max Lucado says, Jesus died on purpose. No surprise, no hesitation, no faltering. You can tell a lot about a person by the way he dies, and the way Jesus marched to his death leaves no doubt. He'd come to earth for this moment. Peter preaching in Acts 2 says this in verse 23, Jesus was given to you, and with the help of those who don't know the law, you put him to death by nailing him to a cross. But this was God's plan, which he had made long ago. He knew all this would happen. See, the journey of the cross didn't begin in Jericho. It didn't begin in Galilee. It didn't begin in Nazareth. And it didn't even begin in Bethlehem. The journey to the cross began long before as the echo of the crunching of the fruit was still sounding in the garden, Jesus was on his way to Calvary. The journey to the cross is a journey of love. He willingly took that journey. Our Lord and Savior paid the price for our sin. The journey of the cross allows us to be restored to God for all who accept his work on the cross. The journey to the cross changed my life and I pray it changed yours as well. As we come to the table, let's use these next few moments to ask the Spirit of God to search our hearts, to point out anything that would not be in line with what he'd have for us, and then in faith repent, accepting his work on the cross once again, repenting of our sin, and committing to, to following Jesus each and every day. And then we'll celebrate together remembering the road trip that Jesus took, paying the price for our sins, so that we can experience relationship with God. 1 Corinthians 11, starting in verse 23, says this, On the night when he was betrayed, the Lord Jesus took some bread and gave thanks to God for it. Then he broke it in pieces and said, This is my body which is given for you. Do this to remember me. And in the same way, he took the cup of wine after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant between God and his people, an agreement confirmed with my blood. Do this to remember me as often as you drink it. For every time you eat this bread and drink this cup, you're announcing the Lord's death until he comes again. Let us pray for the elements, and then we'll partake together. Father God, we thank you for the gift of your Son. We thank you that Jesus came, was born into this world, and paid the price so that we can be forgiven and experience a relationship with God. Father, I pray that today you will remind us of the journey that you took on our behalf, and that you'll personalize it for it for us, and that we will realize in maybe new ways and maybe fresh ways that you died on the cross for our sins, that you died so that we can be forgiven, you died so that we can experience the fullness of life, and that you died so that we can take the life-changing message of Jesus to those that you place in our lives. Father God, today, 
I pray that you'll point out anything that is not in line with what you'd have for us and that we will repent accepting your work once again. We thank you that the cross is big enough to pay the price for all of our sins, for whatever we may have done or whatever we may do. Father, we may we live in the repentant state, giving praise and glory to you each and every day. We thank you that on our behalf, your body was broken and your blood was shed so that we can be forgiven. We thank you that you rose again, conquering death, paying the price for our sin as the sacrificial lamb of God. Father, minister to our hearts. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let us partake of both the bread and the cup today. It's the body broken and the blood shed for each and every one of us. Let's partake together. As is our custom on Communion Sundays, we receive a benevolent offering. For those in the room, there's new offering plates put out at the back. If you haven't dropped off your tithe and you still need to do that, just make sure you use an envelope. All loose change will be given to our benevolent fund. If you're joining us online, you can give a number of ways. Again, through our website, hhachurch.com, slash give, or through the e-transfer using the email address giving at hhachurch.com and market for benevolence. It's an opportunity for us to be the hands, feet, and voice to those within our faith community, as well as in the communities that surround us. And we're grateful for your generosity to this fund. It's used quite regularly, and it's an opportunity for us to come alongside those that are finding this season a little bit hard. As a reminder for us all, next Sunday we go to two services, 9.15 and 11. Our 9.15 service will have nursery through grade four with youth starting at nine o'clock. And our 11 o'clock service will have nursery through grade six. And it's an opportunity for us to gather. Following our 11 a.m. service, our Harvest Hawaiian Hoopla, we'd encourage you to bring your lawn chair and stay for that. It'll be a great chance to connect with each other. And then the following Saturday, the 17th, 18th, I'm sorry again, the 18th, we will be having our Harvest Carnival and an opportunity to serve our community that way. We'd love to have you sign up to volunteer for that. See Pastor Diane in the foyer, and she can give you some more information how you can be involved. Now these words from Romans chapter 15. I pray that the God God of source of hope will fill you completely with joy and peace because you trust in him. Then you will overflow with a confident hope through the power of the Holy Spirit. May God bless you as you go into the remainder of your day. If you'd like prayer, our prayer team will be at the front. If you're online, you can email us at help at hhachurch.com. We can set up a prayer time for you that way. May God bless you as you go into the week to be the hands, feet, and voice of Jesus.